start off by showing you a short animated video clip that basically lets you hear from disabled people themselves about what it feels like to be experiencing violence, abuse, harassment on a daily basis. Because I think that's a really impactful video and it conveys things much better than I can ever hope to convey. After that, I'm going to talk about a model for trying to understand issues around safety and security of disabled people in the community and in institutions. Because what I've been working very hard on in recent years is to try to shift the discourse and the representation away from just talking about disabled people are vulnerable and hence they are at risk of suffering from hate crimes or violence and abuse. I don't find that representation at all helpful and it actually stymies effective action. And then I'm going to try to make that model come alive by drawing on the experiences and evidence that I've been involved in through a number of my different work strands. Now, before we start, the, 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 the clip that I'm going to show you might be quite distressing to some people. I, I found it useful in repeated presentations now to actually come with a health warning in advance that some of the information might be a bit distressing, and understandably so, because they are quite awful experiences that you'll be hearing about. And also, um, my entire presentation is informed by the social model approach towards looking at disability and understanding disability. And that's basically founded upon a belief in the UK disabled people's movement that you cannot understand the experiences of disabled people just by looking at their disability and impairment as if that in and of itself explains their experiences. Instead, you've got to look at the interaction between the impairment and the wider environment, be it a physical environment, societal structures, and attitudes. So it's shifting the gaze away from the disabled person and onto wider society. That is why I use the terminology of disabled people. That's a political terminology that's coined by the disabled people's movement in the UK. People are disabled by wider disabling structures and attitudes. It's not the impairment in and of itself that disables the person. Um, oh, yeah, this is the... Oh, you want no, to exhibit the, 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 the video, video yeah. Yeah, uh, right, let's see. Okay, great. Um, Apologies in advance, the, the, the sound quality in the clip isn't very good, but it's also captioned and subtitled, so hopefully you can, you can follow. Susie and Charlie are a middle-aged couple, both of them have mental health problems. They live together in a house they own in the large city in southwest England. Susie and Charlie took part in this research interview because they believe that no one should have to go through the type of harassment they experienced at the hands of their next door neighbours. Thank <laughs> you. 
The harassment from their neighbours went on for four years. Over time it became more frequent until it was happening every day. Even though a lot of the harassment was described by the police as low-level antisocial behaviour, the fact that it was happening on a daily basis meant that Susie and Charlie felt their lives had been taken away from them. They felt scared in their own home and used to spend their evenings drinking coffee in the shopping mall as that was the only place that stayed open late and didn't cost very much. The police and the council told Susie and Charlie that the things their neighbours were doing to them were not serious enough for them to be able to take any action. They were told to try and ignore their neighbours. It eventually got to the point where they felt so alone that Susie made an attempt on her own life. Not long after, Charlie had a heart attack, which the doctor said was caused by stress. After four years, Susie and Charlie began to consider selling their house and moving to get away from the situation. In the end, however, they didn't need to as their neighbour got a new job and left the city last year. Susie and Charlie say that although they are happy that their troubles have now ended, they don't think that justice has been done. It's So I think you would have heard from that clip what the impact of what so many statutory agencies, including the police, simply dismiss as low-level incidents actually have really, really high impact. So why do we continue trivializing the experiences? And these are very routine daily experiences of a lot of disabled people up and down the country. Until we start calling them what they are, which are different forms of disabled informed hate crimes and just completely unacceptable behavior. Otherwise, we will never devote the resources and time to tackle it effectively. And I think in that clip, you would also have heard the failures of interagency working, the, 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 the implications on disabled people disclosing their impairments or conditions for those that don't have as visible impairments. And what does that do to someone you, when you feel like you're a prisoner in your own home or that you don't even dare to go home because the home, your private space, is not yours because someone makes you feel like a prisoner inside your own home. So the work I'm going to talk about draws on three main sources. There's a cluster of research studies that I've been directing over the past few years, um, and a number have been mentioned, which was the Equality and Human Rights Study into Disabled People's Experiences of Targeted Violence and Hostility. That studies triggered the Commission's formal inquiry that has only recently completed and reported. So if you're interested, do go onto the Commission's website to look at the results of the formal inquiry. And most recently in May, it was a learning disability charity, MENCAP's work on the Stand By Me campaign, and the, resource, uh, the, the research report was called Don't Stand By. 
In addition to the research, it's also about my own personal practice engagement with a range of police forces across England and with a range of disabled people's organizations and working with them to try to crack the issues of addressing chronic underreporting, of being able to engage more effectively with the disabled communities and localities, and in empowering people to be heard and for their evidence to be taken seriously and not have their credibility doubted at each step of the way. Last but not least, I'm hugely interested in all aspects of equality and diversity, and I think that actually some of the most effective remedies to tackling disability hate crime needs to come from practice sharing across the experience of how other types of hate crimes are being tackled. But I say that with a caveat that we need to look at commonalities and differences, because there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. In England, it's been quite risky in that the race model of dealing with hate crime has quite simply been transposed uncritically on a range of other hate crime areas, and that is not always very useful. So what is a layers of influence model? It is basically, I pinched the model from um, public health, so I have to put my hands up and declare that. It's a very well-known public health model that's recognized by the World Health Organization that basically makes it very clear, and it sounds so simple when you say it, that if you're trying to address an individual's health and well-being issues, you cannot just target that individual. What about the family members that live in the same household that may have an influence on that person's eating habits, exercise, fitness regime. What about the company that person works in and what they do in terms of working hours? What about wider society's attitudes towards healthy eating and healthy lifestyles? So in a similar sense, I think a layers of influence model is absolutely spot on for helping us understand issues to do with disabled people's security and safety. And that is to recognize that disabled people, just like any other person, are embedded in wider nested hierarchies of different levels of social aggregates. So if you start in the center of the circle, the disabled person himself or herself, disability is only one aspect of any disabled person's identity. It is not the primary identifier in all instances. So we mustn't assume that it's always the disability that explains everything else. A person is never just disabled. A person is also a man or a woman, has a certain age, has a certain ethnic background, has a certain income socioeconomic status, and all those do have an influence on that person's experience. And wrapped around the disabled person are the family, friends, and carers. And we do know from the evidence that family members of disabled people can similarly be victimized by perpetrators of disability hate crime. So for instance, very well documented evidence on children of disabled people being victimized just because one or both of the parents happen to be disabled. And quite critically, the immediate sphere surrounding the disabled person can play a very critical conditioning role it is usually well-intentioned. We don't want bad things to happen to the people we care about and love. However, the conditioning effect of family members and carers and friends can often be to persuade the disabled pe person just to ignore the incident, to ignore the perpetrators, not put himself or herself in risky positions or in risky situations. Although that's well-intentioned, it does have implications for social inclusion. Is it fair that we advise the people we love to self-exclude just so that they can be out of harm's way? Or should something else actually be the focus of what we do to tackle the problems? Organizations, institutions around disabled people, how many of them actually see that they have a role in tackling violence and abuse against disabled people? Most people you talk to just think that this is a policing criminal justice issue. It is not. It can happen anywhere, in schools, in workplaces, in health and social care agencies, sometimes perpetrated by health and social care um, agency staff. So which ones of those organizations actually see it as part of their day job to be preventing these things from happening to disabled people? Last but not least, wider societal attitudes and awareness and behaviors around disability. What do we as a society think of when we think disabled people? 
I used to be at the Disability Rights Commission in the UK, and every year we would run annual awareness and attitude surveys. And it is very clear that the finding has not moved in about five, six years, that it is still very much, when you talk about a disabled person, the wider perception is white sticks or wheelchairs. That is the limit as to what people are aware of when you're talking about disabled people. And also, what's our attitude towards disability? It's still very much thinking in terms of a lack of, as being incomplete. And that causes us to doubt the, the, the competence and capacity. And what's really scary right now with public spending cuts and the, and the austerity measures is that we're getting reports from disabled people that harassment and abuse against them have gone up because politicians are too lazy to make the distinction that disabled people are not benefiting benefit scroungers. And the number of times disabled people have come up to us and say that this is getting worse because of the austerity drive, are we failing certain sections of our population? So the layers of influence model is useful because it shows that it's the characteristics of the different entities within each sphere that have an influence, but not in any deterministic way. It's also about how they interact across the different spheres. Now, what might this look like? Um, I'm sure a lot of you might have heard about the Winterbourne View Hospital scandal outside Bristol in May. That was an inpatient um, hospital run by a private sector provider in which people with severe learning disabilities on autism were placed. And that led to systemic abuse and torture that was exposed in a pan panorama special um, in May this year. How can the layers of influence model help us understand what went on in Winterbourne View? Immediately when Winterbourne View was exposed in the Panorama Special, all you get in the media was about they were vulnerable and let's remove them from that situation because it's now being abusive to them. At no point was there actually any acknowledgement of has this got anything necessarily to do with the, the, the disabled people being vulnerable? Or did we actually put them in situations that magnify and amplify their vulnerabilities and hence their risk of experiencing certain, certain, certain types of violence and abuse? So if you look at the layers of influence model, why do societal attitudes, disabled people, especially people with severe learning disabilities, still thought about as being in need of care and in need of a certain kind of care, which is institutionalization. And although, as John alluded to earlier in Cornwall and uh, certainly Sutton and Merton PCT, there have been previous high-profile abusers of people with learning disabilities in these settings. Recommendations made since 2005 for change. Nothing has changed. Why? Are we coming across some other barriers that are not just about the structures and the organizational cultures, but actually wider society's attitude towards what we think of disabled people? If you look at the organizations that have evolved to meet the needs, the care needs of disabled people, actually they have reproduced and sustained the dependency of disabled people. The scary data from the UK is that the majority of residential placements in the UK are adults with learning disabilities. Not just that, but they are institutionalized and out of area placements. And that has been recognized by the Department of Health as being poor practice for many years now. So why is it still happening? And we push on about personalization, but personalization has sidelined many groups of disabled people, especially people with learning disabilities, because they're not just thought of as competent enough to wield their personal budgets and make decisions around their lives. Family members, once your, 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 your family member is in a setting like Winterbourne View that's out of area, you hardly get to see them. And you put your trust in the professional, as a professional is the expert who cares and therefore knows better. At no point in time did anyone actually ask the disabled people themselves, what does good care look like to you? And instead, we just put blind faith in the professionals who are supposed to have their best interests at heart, which of course, they did not because we have put them in settings that actually sustain the unequal power relationships that cause the abuse to be systemic 
And that links back again to the wider societal attitudes. We see disabled people as not being competent, not being full, not being complete, that they're lesser human beings. And it's just a short step away from the act of dehumanization that the staff at Winterbourne View Hospital adopted towards their wards and their care. So to understand risk, we can't just look at the disabled person. We have to look at the wider structures around them. We know for a long time that there's a very strong link between disability and socioeconomic status. And that disability is both a cause and a consequence of poverty. For instance, one in six people who become disabled while at work loses their job in their first year and that the poorest fifth of the population are twice as likely to develop severe mental health conditions. So poverty and disability cannot be regarded separately. And poverty and socioeconomic status manifest themselves very differently geographically at the national scale, at the regional scale, and at the local scale. But why is it that we are still putting some of our most vulnerable people in hard to let areas and then wonder why things happen to them. I'm aware that I've completely run out of time and I've barely got going. <laughs> take five, take five more. Okay, sure. And certain groups are at risk, not because they just have a disability label, but because that disability label interacts with what I call a number of other minoritized identities. That's not about minority, because it's not about numbers. Women are not a minority. Women are in the numerical majority, but it's a minoritized identity that points to unequal power relationships. So if you've got more than two minoritized identities, you are more at risk. And it's also not just your real identity, but the perceived identities. What other people think you are can sometimes determine their course of actions towards you. And these are the different types of experiences that disabled people are exposed to. The, the finding that is very consistent is that actually a lot of them have been trivialized as so-called low level, but they're persistent, and actually they have very high impact. So if you're trying to tackle the, the, the issues around safety and security of disabled people, you cannot just tackle the severe end of it, because it comes with a very, very long tail of these other persistent ongoing incidents. And there's no such thing as low level, so can we stop using the term to denigrate the experiences of disabled people. Paul Igansky at the University of Lancaster looked at data for many years of the British Crime Survey that showed that regardless of the crime, if the crime was motivated by prejudice, it had disproportionate harm on the victim compared to a victim of an identical crime that wasn't motivated by prejudice. So there's no such thing as low level. These are the areas that things tend to happen. And there are no recognizable villains. Different sorts of motivations, which again, you can link to some of the layers of influence um, 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 evidence. But Home Office says these are just adults leading everyday lives, the perpetrators. So what it means is that we cannot look at risk simply in terms of the disability. There are other identities. But we also cannot just look at risk in terms of the totality of the in-person characteristics, because they're wider structural variables. Vulnerability is situational. Vulnerability is not a fixed property embedded in a person just because he or she is born that way or has a certain characteristic. So stop looking for easy victims. Stop looking for visible villains because they do not exist. And here are some of the impact and responses. You know, no doubt aggravation of existing conditions, including physical and mental health conditions. If disabled people try to take direct action for redress, sometimes they can be perceived as the perpetrators of antisocial behavior. Um, as Susie and Charlie's clip show, there's a fear of disclosure. Section 146 is something in the Criminal Justice Act in England that allows sentencing uplift if it's based on prejudice, based on disability or homophobic intentions. But if people don't disclose, that legislative tool cannot be used for sentence uplift. So there are a range of implications. And the very dangerous tendencies for wider con conditioning, be they well-intentioned, to avoid or to accept. And the scary thing is the bulk of disabled people we speak to don't even know that what they're experiencing on a routine basis constitutes hate crime because they think that's what life is, that they cannot expect anything better. And if you and I see something happening in the street and we do nothing, 
we are proving them right, that their experiences don't matter. And the perpetrators who think they can get away with it, they do get away with it because we don't intervene and we don't stand up and say this is not good enough. Responses from different agencies, three different types, protectionists, driven by the, the view that disabled people are vulnerable. So rather than thinking that there are need of access to justice or redress, what we do is to protect and to take them out of a situation, but not actually change the structures that reproduce that situation. So, and we think of it as an, a social policy intervention rather than criminal justice. So it's about social care abuse, it's not a hate crime. Deficiency, disabled people are lacking. They have their credibility doubted when they report to police. Or it can be punitive. Disabled people can themselves be thought of as a nuisance displaying antisocial behavior. Um, and I'm just going to end there. That, that uh, we, I really do think we do need to push on the right space approach. It's not a simple approach, as John mentioned earlier. You have to weigh up balances. It has to be proportionate. But for heaven's sakes, do involve disabled people, because they know what is important to them. And they can help manage the, those risks far better than we can ever hope to do. And for copies of the report and the video, just go on that website. Thank you. Thank I'm you so sorry. Yeah,